Hello! Welcome to the Sweet Tea Shakespeare Hours, where we spend time well by spending it together. I'm Claire Martin. Okay, so I, I suppose we ought to actually talk about <laughs> the reason we're Enneagrams? Here. <laughs> First of all, welcome to all of you out there in, um, in the universe. We're on YouTube, Hello. Twitch, Periscope slash Twitter, Facebook A, and Facebook B. So um, it's an exciting time. And if you have anything to say to us during this entire time, just post a little comment and uh, we'll see it. And maybe we will uh, respond to you, uh, call you by name and publicly embarrass you, which would be great for all the threes out there. They would love it. <laughs> nice segue. So today we're talking about threes. <laughs> I might be a three. You, you say you that every single week this is going to be like our comedic gag like every week is going to start with you saying i might be X. we might get to we will get to a number that i'm not uh that nine. i'm confident that i'm not it's going to take us getting to nine I, i'm definitely not a nine but <laughs> I, I know i don't think i'm a five no <laughs> no so, so but but the others like there are elements I don't think I'm a mm -hmm. seven really either, but anyway, um, so we'll, we'll get there. Let's hit, let's learn about, let's learn about threes today. Yeah. Okay. You guys. So here we go. So the three is the achiever or the performer. So something that all in Shakespeare land are probably familiar with in some way, shape or form. So, uh, thinking back to the way we address the type one, the type two, we're going to talk about their core needs, their core desires, their core fears. Um, and then the ways in which maybe some of the other numbers and, um, movements on the Enneagram can also influence them. So we'll try to sprinkle those out a little bit later, but right now, we're talking about the three, which is in the very middle of the heart center. So the heart triad or the feeling triad, um, it's a center of intelligence, which means this is the way you perceive the world, right? This is how you look at the world as you go about your life. Um, you address things with feelings and your orientation around your feelings. You trust your heart, right? Instead of your body or your head or your thoughts. Um, the emotion, once again, in the heart center that they have the easiest access to is guilt or shame. So we're still going to talk a lot about that sort of uh, yeah, Jeremy, <laughs> we're still going to talk a lot about guilt and shame throughout this. Um, threes are interesting because they're actually in the center of the triad, right? So they're on either side, they have, um, the two and the, the four, meaning they don't have any connection to any other triad. So there's three numbers in the Enneagram system that are all connected by a triangle. Um, and those are actually referred to as the anchor points. So it gets a little confusing when we talk about trying to group them in the heart center, because that anchor point is actually disconnected the most from their feelings. So even though we're talking about the fact that they interpret the world through their heart, the three being in the center of that triad is actually disconnected and repressed when it comes to feelings. Um, they actually have the, the, the least amount of touch. Like, so the two super emotionally fluent, you know, has tons of language around their emotions and feelings can identify things. And the same with the four, the three kind of represses all that. So they're the most out of touch. So keep that in mind as we're going through. And if you're trying to group them, uh, according to this, like feeling centric, uh, framework. Um, they are really success oriented. They focus on work, you know, love checking off tasks. They're also very image driven. So these folks want to make sure that everyone knows how successful they are. Um, there are obviously varying levels of that and what that looks like. Um, for the most part though, you are going to know that you're talking to a three or that you're looking up to a three because their list of accomplishments, you know, are miles and miles long. You know, that if you give a three a task, they're not only going to do it, they're going to exceed your expectations and be moving on to the next thing because that's actually how they feel love is by being praised and admired and adored. So there's this, again, there's a self-perpetuating sort of cycle for the three who feels like they can't be loved for who they are that they can only be, why would someone love me unless it's because of what I do? So they then become very over-identified in their roles and their, you know, what, what it is that they consider themselves to be and their list of accomplishments are really tied closely to their perception of how worthy 
they are um, just in life, which is kind of kind of sad. <laughs> um, all right, so they're but really desire. resonating with me. That is really resonating with me. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so Qu- yeah. Keep talking. Core desire is to feel worthy or accepted. Um, so that's just your basic need. So there's this need to be successful because that feels like love. Um, the fixation or the thing that kind of, uh, clouds their judgment in a way is vanity. Um, their core Ah. fear of being worthless, um, or being without value because they haven't had enough achievements or accomplishments to earn the value. Right. Um, and then the core passion or struggle, that they deal with emotionally is deceit. So that looks like presenting a false image of themselves um, and deceiving others about who they really are. As Thoughts? In, they have to achieve all of this stuff because they don't think they're worth it. Intrinsically. And that's part of the deceit, right? That's the performance part, right? Yep. I'm going to present yep. like a face. Yeah. Yeah. So threes also, one thing I like to talk about or that helps me kind of is, you know, frame all of the the different types is walking into a party. Like how do you, how do you approach a party? Right. So a three would walk in and literally like kind of gauge who's in the room and who they need to be in the room, uh, to be perceived as the most successful or to be like the life of the party kind of in a Like, oh my gosh, everybody wants to see that person, talk to that person, you know, like, uh, almost like ladder climbing, um, like who do I need to be in this scenario, in this environment to be perceived as really successful and to be like most admired, right. Or most adored. So whereas like a two is after like appreciation by way of affection, the three is looking at like adoration, admiration, adulation. um, yeah, being yeah. kind of elevated up on this like pedestal of like, wow, that person's got it all. Um, famous threes include John Travolta, Tony Robbins, Martha Stewart, Oprah Winfrey, um, and Barbara Streisand was another random one that I wrote oh, yeah. down. I can see and that. And then we did uh, we did Parks and Rec on the past two episodes, so I'm going to throw out Tom Haverford for the three on this one. Um, not particularly passionate about the job that he does, but because that is his job and his role, he's going to do it well and he's going to look good doing it. So <laughs> that's kind of part of his thing. Like he brings a style. Everybody loves him. Super charismatic. Um, you know, does the sad hustle thing a lot more passionately than he does his actual parks and rec job. But he's kind of known as like just smooth and like everybody thinks he's more accomplished than he maybe really is. So. Cool. So I, I, I don't mean to put too fine a point on it, but you've just described every actor and director I've ever met. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing. Like this is, our field is littered with threes. I'm, I'm fascinated by that actually. So I think folks that are successful in whatever their craft um, could either be, you know, it could be successful for different reasons, but I definitely think there's a drive that's present in the three, um, that helps to kind of push any sort of prominence in a field forward. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, they've, someone has done, I think it was Richard Rohr did countries, like what kind of personas are different countries and America is a three country, like yeah, with everything. Capitalism. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, he, he even mentioned, you know, most of the presidents that we've had in the last decade are t- like classic threes. Um, you can have different sort of dynamics of the three with the wings, which we can talk about a little bit later, but, um, which can, you know, pull out different sorts of flares. Um, or we'll hear the three with a two wing. Remember the twos are the, the two and the four on either side, they flank the three. So those either two of those numbers influence the threes, um, sort of, you know, core traits, the three with a two wing is called the charmer. So they're going to pull in a little bit more of that, like friendliness, the poise, um, the generosity and the focus on relationships. Uh, so that's your three with the two wing. Okay. And then so the that's three Barack with- Obama. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then the three with the four wing is called the professional. So they're more oriented around, you know, work. Um, they're very task focused. They're less like one-on-one relationship driven and way more um, pragmatic. Hey, Claire, uh, are you with- feeling convicted right now? T- 
slow. But also, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I don't know if we want to go here. Okay, that's do fine. We, do we want to? Do we imagine our current president is a disillusion three? No, I mean, sorry, not disillusion. Um, fully illusioned three. <laughs> fully illusioned. A hundred percent. Yeah. All threes are illusioned, I would say, based on mm-hmm. what you've said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there, the you know, we talked about like unhealthy threes. So that gets into layered levels of like narcissism and like deep deception of others. Um, so that can definitely play a part because what happens is the three will literally chameleon themselves to be whatever it is and like can become really deceitful <laughs> in that way also. So like these ideas of grandeur and like these just kind of off the wall alternate facts maybe play in a lot to this uh, image of being the best or, you know, so winning. it's like, it's like <laughs> Stephen Colbert's Stephen Colbert persona is also a three. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Basically. Maybe his stage persona. A, I actually yeah. think he's tight. He self-identified himself as a seven before. I'd have to look that up to be sure. I'm, I'm um, thinking like he as a as a person might character. be something else, but his character. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. a three. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean the thing the thing with all I know about threes is that people always assume I am one. So everything you're saying is like is ringing true for me because I'm like this is I think what people see. And this is what people, this is why people peg me as a three, but it doesn't fundamentally, I still feel more aligned with the eight. So but- the three have a few things in common. Um, so the reason why that might be kind of what you're seeing, the three, eight, and seven are all in the same grouping when it comes to the ways in which they get their needs met. Um, so this is an assertive sort of triad. Yeah. So there's assertive, dominant, and compliant. Um, so if you had to choose one of those, I assume assertive would probably yeah. be top on your list. Um, so they all sort of have that in common and they do it in different ways. The three um, is ag- aggressive or assertive um, with the way in which they approach their goals because that's mm-hmm. how they earn affection. Um, and eight would go about that as a power or control sort of focus. Um, so they also threes. Now this is something that doesn't, they don't have this in common with the eight and the six, but they have it in common with the one and the five. Um, the way in which they deal with conflict is by competency. So there's either positive outlook, competency, or compliance when it comes to dealing with conflict in their lives. So what that looks like for a three is being extremely efficient and just outstanding at everything. Again, to bolster that image that they're trying to present of being successful. And what's an eight in that? The program? eight does that. The eight doesn't. Oh, the eight is um, uh, assertive or uh, conflict. No, it's po- it's called positive reaction or mm, I just lost the word. It's more about like dealing with it head on, right? That's Instead me. of like, that's okay, me. so that's, that's the eight. Yeah. Me. Let me, let me fact check that real quick. Cause I should give you that word, but yeah, you guys talk amongst yourselves. Um, they also go to six and nine in stress. So that might be helpful here to talk about too. So when a three is stressed, when this is not your best, you know, you're falling through your levels of health as a three and you need extra coping mechanisms to help you cope and get through the thing. The three actually goes to the nine. Um, if they make that move in a good way and the nine is the peacemaker, remember, um, threes have a tendency to kind of run over people in order to produce, right? So they forget that people are important. Um, so by going to nine, they can kind of slow down, (laughs) um, take a break. They really get burned out really quickly, really easily because of this, you know, again, obsession with getting things checked off and done. Um, so when they go to nine, they can rest, they can find some peace. Um, and they can also sort of, um, realize that people are important. Um, when they do that in a bad way or an unhealthy way though, and they go to the low side of the nine, they can become paralyzed and apathetic to the results. So (laughs) that's not really a good move. Yeah. In health, they can reach out to six, which is across the triangle over in the head center that helps them realize that commitment to others is greater than, or more important than the actual thing that they're producing or the, the thing that they're accomplishing. Um, and it can actually help, um, bolster courage in them. They can tap into the sixes kind of virtue of courage, um, to be able to like not be so fearful about 
failing, right? Because that's a big kind of preoccupation with threes. They, they, failure is not done, it's not done well. Like that is actually kind of a, it's, it's, it's a must for a three. They need to fail in order to be healthy and spiritually healthy and kind of learn resilience through that. But it is something that like keeps them up at night. Um, so it can be something that they need the energy from the six from to learn, to have the courage to step out and fail. So, okay. Jeremy, we have a bunch of Shakespearean threes. Yeah, I'm not feeling <laughs> like super bunch. great right now, by the way. I'm, I know, you guys are, I like, we need to pause, like commercial break, let you guys kind of absorb. <laughs> we'll come back. Yeah, I'm feeling personally attacked this week in a way that I haven't oh, in the other two episodes. No, no, you're fine. I still, I still don't think this is my type, but I do think that like, behavior-wise, there's a lot of overlap. So Jeremy, let's talk characters. Who do you have? Who 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 came out to you first? Because both both weeks we've kind of had characters that like jumped out at both of us as like clearly archetypal. Yep. Um, who was that for you with a three? Um, I'm gonna go with the, I'm gonna go with the heavy hitters because I th- I'm gonna go with the heavy hitters. Here sure. here they are. Hamlet. Hotspur. Yep. Uh huh. Julius Caesar. Yeah, I had yep. Cassius. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mac B. Yep. Um, and, and I could go on, but those are the, those are the main ones. Those I had all like, of them except all of them except for Hamlet on my list. Yeah. I, I'd love to talk about Hamlet cause I, cause he's an enigma, but when, when we were talking about paralysis, yes, the low side of nine is a coping mechanism mechanism that makes a lot of sense to me totally um um i mean here, here are others i have i have frederick from as you like it i've touched them from as you like it i have yep. henry the eighth i have yep. uh philip the bastard from king john yep i have cornwall from king lear yep holofernes yep bassanio yep um uh, solerio solanio lorenzo yep uh in merchant of venice i have the page family all of them in yeah. Mary Wives of Windsor. Same. Hermia, Lysander, Don John, Pericles. Wait, Richard... whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hermia and Lysander? Yeah. From Midsummer? Are you kidding me? Demetrius yeah. is like peak three. Yeah. Demetrius well, is like the three epitomized. Yeah. And well, but I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, like, because part of this is like, I don't, they're achi- they're trying to achieve something. That's having a goal, though. I don't think it's any. Yeah. I think if it, if it was anyone with a goal, it would be any every single character in the canon. You may be right. I just you know it's this is a draft. Okay, we're learning things. <laughs> oh, but the thing is, all the other ones we have been like totally aligned. All right, on. eight. All right, I hear you. <laughs> are you withdrawing right now, Jeremy? Or are you complying? That's important. <laughs> um, it's reactive. The word I was looking for a minute reactive. ago. Reactive. That's reactive. That's definitely yep. okay. uh, something I identify with. <laughs> Anyway, skipping Midsummer for a moment, <laughs> I have Don John, Pericles, yep. Yep. Richard the Second, Yep, Autolycus in yep. Winter's Tale, Orsino. Yep. Um, maybe Richard the Third. I want to talk about him. So do I. I had Richard the Second conversation piece written in my notes. Yeah. Um, I have uh Richmond in Richard the Third. <laughs> yep. Paris in Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Prospero, Ariel, Caliban, and uh, I don't have Ariel. I don't have Ariel or Caliban. I do have Prospero and uh, and Aaron from uh, Titus Andronicus. Yes. That's my list. Okay, we almost had identical lists, and I didn't think that was gonna happen. When, like doing this, like all, like literally, almost all of the ones you hit, I have on my list. I'm shocked. That's so cool. You're affirming my genius right now. That's all I can say. Well, I'm affirming your genius with the like glaring exception of a midsummer night's dream. I like, we got to go back to that. But, um, here are the other ones here. are The other ones I have, and I'm going to do like I did before. I just did want, you know, some for every show. So here we go. All's well that ends well Bertram. Now I actually had in my notes, the Bertram complex, because I want us to talk about the Bertram type because Shakespeare explores the, um, I think the image conscious achieving, narcissistic young man many times in his, in his plays. Like, I think it's actually a proto, like, I think it's a type he keeps returning to. 
Bertram complex, and I just want to talk about how that inga- like interacts with the three. Um, and this is this is me doing what Jeremy did last week. Like I took a kind of negative view of the three, and so a lot of these fall into the Bertram category because these guys are the jackasses. So all's well that ends well. I have Bertram as you like it. I also had Frederick and I had Oliver, and I think Oliver has the Bertram complex. Comedy of errors. I have Adriana. Uh, in Cymbeline, we got the Evil Queen. We got Yakimo, and we've got Arviragus. In Love's Labor's Lost, I agree with you about Holofernes, but I think King Ferdinand and the Princess are also threes. And I have a sort of ongoing overarching theory about Love's Labor's that I hope we can sort of continue to like come back to, which is that the four main couples in that play, um, or just, I guess the, the four, yeah, the four courtier couples, I have a theory that like all of them are made up of two people of the same type, which doesn't often happen in Shakespeare, but I think in Love's Labors, he's doing something very, very specific where he's he's making the two on either side of this um, battle of the sexes, this, he's giving them the same type. And that is what draws them to each other. And that's what makes them want to tease the pants off each other. So Love's Labors, I've got Holofernes, King Ferdinand, and the princess who becomes the queen. Measure for measure, I have Aeschylus. Um, I think that his narcissism is what gets in the way of him actually like his his desire to like keep his position and have his like authority and gravitas is what gets in the way of him actually fucking helping the characters. Um, Merchant of Venice, uh, I have Bassanio as well. I think he's I think he's part of the Bertram complex. If I didn't mention him, he's on my list. Oh well, may, maybe you did. Maybe I'm right forgetting. there. Right <laughs> there. I I heard. I heard the boys. I heard. I heard. Lorenzo's. I'm just affirming your genius. Yeah, great. Uh, Mary Wives of Windsor. I also had the entire Page family, but I also think that in that play, not necessarily in the others, it's Falstaff, and I also think Dr. Caius. Sure. So I think it's the Page family, Falstaff, and Dr. Caius. So we've got like a bunch of threes running amok in Mary Wives, and we have no ones, and that is concerning to me. I feel like that's the play that like explodes because of that. Midsummer Night's Dream, Demetrius. Got to come back to this. Much to do. I have Don John. I also have Dogberry. I think Dogberry's. Yeah, three. I thought about I thought about Dogberry, and I I I expect he will fit somewhere else for me. Mm. Okay. Um. I also have Pericles. Taming of the Shrew. I have Petruchio. Mm. He's like classic three. Um. He's a little bit older, but I think he kind of has a bit of the Bertram complex. Uh. Also have Prospero from the Tempest. You're gonna have to explain Ariel and Caliban to me, but I definitely have Prospero. Troilus and Cressida, this is why this play is a mess. Troilus, Hector, Ajax, Agamemnon, Paris, and possibly Patroclus are all three. <laughs> and they all have swords, and that is why this play is a disaster. <laughs> um, Twelfth Night, I have Olivia. Um, two Gentlemen of Verona, Valentine. He's a less, he's a, he's a slightly less problematic member of the Bertram Complex family. Uh, in the Winter's Tale, um, I also had a tall cause. I also think Antigonus possibly because he's more interested in his like in his place in court and his favor with the king than he is with like the um, like moral outrageousness of what he's being asked to do. And he also he keeps shutting up Paulina like in public. He's like, oh, like don't embarrass me, wife. And it just it feels very um, it feels very controlling to me. Um, which may, I don't know, maybe that makes him an eight. I want to talk about the histories a bit later. Like, I'm just going to list them for now, but I want to go back and talk about them just because I feel like my Henriette instincts were like, fi- all the synapses were firing when I was thinking about threes. I also have Hotspur, but I also have Northumberland. I think he learned it from his dad. I also have Prince John and I have the Dauphin. So that's the Henriade. Um, And it's hilarious to me that like Hotspur, Prince John and the Dauphin could potentially all be played by, like you could have one actor doing that track. So it's interesting. Wars of the Roses, Joan of Arc, Richard Plantagenet, who becomes the Duke of York, Jack Cade. I want to talk about R3 because I'm not sure, but I think it's a conversation piece. King John, I also have Philip the Bastard, but I also have Queen Eleanor. Um, and I think that part of the reason why she and Constance like are a Molotov cocktail together is because you have eight going up against three, and they're both like powerful women who want their sons to succeed. Um, in Henry VIII, I also had Henry VIII, but I also had Cardinal Wolsey mm-hmm. from 18th. Antony and Cleopatra, I have Cleopatra and Lepidus. From Coriolanus, I have Volumnia. Volumnia, sorry. Uh, from Hamlet, I have Laertes and Guildenstern, but I just don't, I don't see Hamlet yet. You're gonna have to talk me, talk me through that one. Julius Caesar, I also had Julius Caesar and Cassius, and I also had Cinna. Um, in King Lear, I have Ed. 
something similar like Ethos. I also had Mackers from Mackers. Uh, from Othello, I have Cassio. Um, from R and J, also have Paris. I also think Juliet might be a three. Um, and then Time of Athens was the one play in the lineup that I couldn't think of a single three. Um, because I didn't. I don't see anyone as trying to achieve in that play. I see everyone as just wanting the money. Um, and Titus Andronicus, I have Aaron. But Jeremy, like, from a lot of them, we were totally aligned. So that's my list. Hello. Are you a Patreon subscriber? If so, then this message is for you. Thank you so much for supporting Sweet Tea Shakespeare. As we gear up for another exciting season of shows, concerts, and events, we are issuing a challenge to boost our monthly Patreon sustainer giving. If you can up your pledge, even just a little bit, you will ensure that Sweet Tea Shakespeare can continue making delightful content all year round. You can also buy a season ticket that will grant you access to all of our Patreon content, along with reserved seats to every one of our performances. For more information, check out our website at SweetTeaShakespeare.com or find us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash SweetTeaShakes. Thanks so much. Okay, where are we starting? Do you want to talk about <laughs> Hamlet? Burton, yeah, Ariel. I do actually. I do want. Yeah, let's, let's start with Hamlet because I just you you know my feelings about this play as a play. So maybe I just wasn't giving him a fair shake. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know that I'm right. I think he could very well be a four. Um, That's what I had. And um, uh, but I think he is concerned with um, image and how he is seen. To be, mm. to be doing or not doing. I think the whole play, right, is about whether he's going to do or not do and his struggle with the, with the, with, with whether and how and what he's going to achieve or not. Mm -hmm. And his initial concerns are about how his achievement has been interrupted. Um, you know, he's been, he's been replaced, um, in terms of his trajectory, uh, so those are some reasons. Um, he seems to think of his education, which is a big part of that play, uh, and his identity as an sure. achievement. And so some of what I heard Kelly talking about earlier is, is like the part of me that's that's sort of um, resonates with the three is like I just like I like degrees, you know what I mean? I like go collect them, and uh, titles aren't too bad either, and positions aren't too bad either. And I see that being important to, to Hamlet in some way. And that his struggle is he's been confronted with this reality that won't let him achieve his potential. Um, and, he, and, and that throws him into crisis. But I absolutely also think he, uh, if he's a, I could see him being a three wing four or four wing three um, because he absolutely is also an actor. Yeah. Um, and I see most of the actors that I know, either one of those two things, either they're built on image or they're built on independent, like whatever that is in a four we'll talk about tomorrow, but like that independence and that sort of like needing to be special kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, um, and, and Frank, frankly, I could see uh, an actor sort of run away with a three reading or run away with a four reading of that character. Uh, and could be interesting. So the okay. differentiators between three and four things that we need to focus on, you nailed it, Jeremy, it's image. Um, so is it being competent, successful, or is it being, um, unique and different and not like other people, right? So those are the differentiators between three being the former four being the latter. The other thing is the motivation. Uh, so is it results based like tangible results? Um, or is it, a deeper purpose, like meaning values, right? Yeah. So there's your three versus your four. And then the other one is emotions. So threes actually push their feelings aside a lot. Like we've already kind of touched on. Um, they're a bit harder to identify because they get in the way of achieving or accomplishing. Um, and the four super introspective, yeah, all the feels, like you me. know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's yeah. really interesting because if, if he is a four and I, I would totally buy that, it's, it's definitely got that, that, achieving wing to it do you know mm. what i mean like it's it's yep. definitely part of the way he tells his story it's yeah it's interesting i mean i i would agree with that to a certain extent but i don't i think that 
so much of what I read is Hamlet's um, frustration about the inheritance specifically and about like the fact that he can't be a leader, even though he should be by rights. Um, and, and that image thing, like I see that, I read that as learned, as learned behaviors that he has seen, that he saw his parents do, that he is now using as a survival technique because he is still subjected to a king um, who who doesn't really have a lot of reason to, to trust him. So I read the, and, and with like the education piece that you were talking about, I've always read his desire, his like potent desire to go back to Wittenberg as a desire to get the hell out of Dodge, like just mm-hmm. to get away. to like western himself somewhere with people that he's friends with like an rng um but i i read that as an escape tactic an escape route rather than having anything to do with the um the intellectualism so it's interesting that you that you bring that up because i i guess i just read his motivations differently one one thing i just want to take a minute to um pitch a lovely play called wittenberg or wittenberg um, oh, it's so good. It's really good. And it explores this kind of thing in terms of his, his internal, um, his internal struggle between, um, the, the education and posturing of Martin Luther, who I think is a, is, is a three, or at least is pushing against a three in a lot of ways. And, wait, and wait, 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 Martin Luther. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and John, he's not Fa- a one. Um, no, yeah, sure. I'm, but I'm like that. Uh, um, but it's, 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 uh, it's about I mean, for Martin Luther. It's about, you're right. It's about rules and laws and that kind of thing. But it's also about like, um, uh, spiritual achievement that can never be obtained. Do you know what I mean? And, um, anyway, sure. we'll talk but, about that. And yeah. then John Faustus, who's it was called the reformation. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. So threes, threes and threes and ones orientation around rules. Like a one can't break them, and the three doesn't care about them. Done is better than good, as far as a three is concerned. If they get to cross it off and it passes muster, even at the base level, like they want it to be like perceived as a good product, but it doesn't have to be like perfect. Whereas a one would like agonize um, and miss deadlines in order for it to be a perfect. Thing. I don't think I know about, I don't think I know enough about Martin Luther. I just don't know how we can not, how we can have a literal type called the reformer and not, <laughs> not, not, and not yeah, I get it. you there. Yeah. I get you there. But I think my overall point is that that play sort of points to, um, sort of imaginary influences on Hamlet it, that, that are competing and, 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 um, putting him into stress, right? Actually. And, and, um, and, and, the question becomes like whether he's going to live into his sort of the identity that's sort of built for achievement, as you say, and the expectations of achievement being the son of a king, you know, and the maybe heir apparent and, and this other identity that's a little bit more romantic and fiery. And, and he, he believes might be a little bit more authentic. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, you know, it's interesting that you, that you use that word authentic because I think, quite quite contrary to how he behaves in his own play and the tactics that he uses i don't i don't read hamlet as someone who wants to be a performer i don't read him as someone who wants to be an actor i read as as someone who puts that on to 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 buy time and to study and to to process and to try to like and like to basically try to ready himself um I actually think the character craves authenticity. And that is like, it's moments when he, um, when he strikes at authenticity or when he like reveals it inadvertently that the character like comes alive for me. So like, for instance, um, when he first sees Horatio, like that first scene, second scene, whatever, where, where, they connect and um, uh, Horatio says something offhandedly as, as a joke about being a truant and Hamlet's like, don't you dare, don't you dare go there. Don't you dare call yourself that. Like, even though Horatio probably meant it as a joke, there is this, like, there's this instantaneous, like um, 
refusal from Hamlet to accept self um, self deprecation from someone that he genuinely cares about. Um, you you have value to me. Don't you dare disparage yourself. And uh, and that to me is like that. Those are those are those few moments where we like see Hamlet, like true Hamlet. Um, and I think that him as a performer is like, I don't know. I just read that as a survival technique. I read it as a coping mechanism rather than something he wants or likes doing. Does that make sense? Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about a three? Because you're saying Kelly, that, that like the performance is, um, is, is the face that gets put on when, when the feelings are being suppressed, right? There's a, there's like artifice there. It is, it is an, it is a coping mechanism, like you just said, uh, but it's a way of getting, feeling love, right? It's a, there's a misperception, uh, by every type, every type has their own sort of disconnect, right? That they've become detached from, uh, their true essence, right? Um, the message that the three lost somewhere along the way, early in childhood, usually is that they are loved for who they are. Somehow they have received that message that they are loved because of what they do, right? So child takes his first steps, mom and dad or whomever clap. Yay. Oh my gosh. I love you so much. All of a sudden that becomes, okay, I got to do that again. I got to do that better. I got to clean my room. I got to this, I got to that, right? I've got to achieve. I've got to accumulate degrees. I've got to do all these things because that's how they feel like they are filling their tank. Um, and they have a hard, really hard time pulling away from that. The four, though, would be more about um, feeling that they are special because of who they are. And it isn't so much attached to works and things. They can do things. They can achieve and accumulate accolades and all of the things just like a four or a three does. But the four is going to feel a disconnect from just the, the deepest dark, like deepest parts of who they are, right? Like they feel like no one really gets them, that no one understands them. Um, and that they, they can only be loved if someone sees that in them, but they block it. Right. So two very, I feel, I feel like there's two very different distinctions mm -hmm. there. Um, but the, the outcome can look the same, uh, as far as how they're behaving. I think handled the four, I gotta disagree with you, Jeremy. I don't think you could give either to an actor. I mean, I think you could, but I, I don't. I think he is a four. I think he, I think he lives it out. But I don't know. Will we can? I guess we can talk about it more tomorrow. I'll put him on the list um, for tomorrow, and we'll fight about it yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> um, I do think it's hilarious that we both had the entire Page family because when I wrote that down, I was like, oh, he's not gonna agree. And I think it's hilarious that we both, uh, committed fully. It certainly explains a lot about that play. Um, okay, we got to talk about Midsummer Night's Dream. What, why, why Lysander and Hermia? Like, first of all, why them? But then secondly, why not Demetrius? I feel, so I, uh, this is fully formed. Uh, uh, this is not fully formed. And it's, it's a little bit of a draft. But I think part of what's driving Lysander and Hermia is this is the image thing is the like and the image is different than than demetrius who i might concede but the the image with demetrius seems much more like or his story seems much more like this is the way it ought to go this is what yes. i deserve this is this is like um, bertram oliver and and that feels to me initially a little bit more like how one might approach things but i'm i'm open to 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 conversation there. And, and the reason I think one is because I think, I think, uh, Aegeus is one in terms of the, the ought to ness of how this story ought to go. The, the rules of how this story ought to go. And Hermia and Lysander are pressing against that certainly. Um, and they're, they're playing with an image that they want to pro pro project and achieve, which is, I think something like, what does it mean for them to look like they're in love and connected and ideal and romantic? But actually, I think that performance masks like darker repressed intent, which is different for each of them, but has to do, I think, with um, for Hermia, I think it's about 
wanting to out image Helena specifically and other peers. Um, and with Lysander, um, that my argument's weaker, but I do think it has to do with um, sort of how they as a couple present and what they want to present. Wow, you read them much more cynically than I do. Yeah, I do. I like, they want to achieve, like what they're, this is the question I had before the show that I'm still, I, I still have, which is like, do threes like achieve objects? And if so, could those objects be other people? In which case, I, I think I think there's an argument to be made for these two as sort of like achieving not only each other as objects, but also the the kind of ideal of marriage and the ideal of this sort of romantic thing um, as mm -hmm. as their primary motivators in the story. I could see that with a two wing because it's because it's more relationship driven. It's more one on one. One other thing, too, that's interesting about threes is they're amazing cheerleaders like if you're trying to do something and you've got a three behind you, they're going to be like your hype man, right? Like they're going to like push you, encourage you. Riso and Hudson call them the motivators, right? Like they are like the ultimate because they not, not always just want to see themselves succeed. Right. But their, their environment and their people um, succeeding as well also helps. That's something else that they can say that they helped and they did. Right. Um, so I had a friend once, uh, have a friend she's, I thought for the longest I would have typed her as a two, but the more I started reading into the three, I was like, holy crap, that's her for sure. Um, so there was the, the relationship aspect. She does relationships well, right? She just does. Um, she's super like, she's amazing. She's in my corner, no matter what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like she's like broadcasting from the rooftops. Like my friend is so amazing. She's like really complimentary, you know, and that's another thing too. Threes really need to hear. You're doing so great. <laughs> You're so great. You're amazing because that's, that's like a love language for them. Um, so nice to know about threes, you know, if you really want to help them out, you know, bless on them, like give them some compliments. Um, one other thing I didn't touch on yet is uh, the mistypes, like the common mistypes. Um, and this might add a little bit of clarity too. Um, threes often mistype as either a five, a one, or an eight. So threes will see themselves as those other types instead of what they actually are. Um, and then the types that are likely to mistype as a three are eights, sevens, and nines. So... There's a few connections, you know, around the, around the wheel. So if there's any that seem a little hung up, I know eight sounds like mm -hmm. there's a pretty strong pull there. And I, I guarantee you that's because of the aggressive sort of nature, um, of both types and the way they handle and confront, um, any sort of challenge or, or obstacle it's for different reasons. So, I, I mean, I could maybe see Hermia. I don't, I don't, I don't read her as wanting uh, a better image than, than Helena. I actually quite the opposite. I think that when she says, um, what is it like heaven grant thee thy Demetrius or something? It's like her parting words to Helena is like, good luck, sis. I don't read that as, um, disingenuous. I read that as like, I'm taking myself, like we're, we're taking ourselves out of the equation and I really hope this works out for you. And I also, I mean, this might be my bias showing up because I played Hermia, but like, I don't, um, I might be able to con concede a three in the sense that like she is a cheerleader for her friend and she's like I want to achieve this like authentic love that like we can brag is like real we married for the right reasons we really care about each other like we have this while at the same time honestly sort of like championing her friend to to find the same um, I don't I don't read competition a sense of competitiveness from Hermia. I think the fact that Helena detects it there is because Helena is like horrendously insecure as a person, like she's neurotic. And so um, the that's why Hermia is so baffled in the lovers scene in the forest because Helena's like, this is your doing or you're all in it to get me and I thought we were friends. And Hermia's like, I had nothing to do with this. I never wanted to hurt you. I never wanted to supersede you, whatever. But do you think, um, do you think that changes at all when they, when, when they're un under the, when the boys are under the influence of the, of the magic flower and some more of the, of the, the like 
real motivations and concerns come out. And there's like the her 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 to me in that in those scenes, she's like she starts off with Lysander, why are you teasing her? Like stop play like call off this really cruel game. Then when she realizes that Lysander either means it or is not willing to stop the game, she turns to Helena and she's like, Did you do this? Did you is this is this your revenge? For the fact that I'm happy, you thought you would like play this game on me. And then the rest of the scene, she's just trying to get Lysander to like come back to her, like stop this, snap out of it, come back to me. So I, she only really gets, um, Helena has a big speech about cherries at some point. Like actually casting insults that she like starts insulting right back. But I don't know. I don't. I don't read that as like her secret feelings of superiority, like la- like like showing their their claws. I don't. I don't. I don't. Don't read it that way. I think. I think Demetrius is like the ultimate three, and I think that's why Hermia hates him because he's so transparent about his narcissistic motiv- motivations. And she finds it really, she finds it a turnoff, I think. I mean, in their, in their one scene together where it's just the two of them, she is like, she is so uninterested in the fact that he, he wants them to have the perfect marriage. He's like, this could work. Come with me. You know, we're perfect for each other. We would be great. We would have status. We would have your father's support, the Duke's support, et cetera, like, we could be so great, babe, ruling the world. And she's like, get out of my way. Um, so I, I just, I think Demetrius, um, I mean, I think Demetrius is like one of the most, he's one of the most narcissistic young lovers in Shakespeare. Like he is just so, he's so image conscious. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't read, I certainly don't read Lysander that way. Um, I think Lysander is probably like, oh my God, I don't know, like a four or a six, probably. Maybe a nine. <laughs> I don't read him as a, as a three. Um, he's a Jeremy. <laughs> he's a Jeremy. <laughs> he's got a few. <laughs> um, that's so interesting that like, because I, I really, in Midsummer, like, I am so inclined to believe the lovers in a way that I rarely am in Shakespeare. Like I'm inclined to believe Helena and and Hermia for their love and for what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, Cause they have so much clarity about it. Like right from the beginning, they're like, he's like, let's run away. And she's like, yeah, let's do that. It's just so like, so easy it's easy in a way that for when Romeo and Juliet meet and they're like let's get married yes <laughs> all right um and I don't I don't know how both parties could be so um assiduous or like I, I'm like I just don't know how they could both buy in so quickly um unless they unless they truly felt it um I don't read them I don't read them cynically so that's Sorry. I think that uh, for me, it, that play is, is in part about the whole thing is about vanity. And, um, and so I think for me, it's about, uh, the competing images that are trying to be unlocked and, and, and put against each other. Um, and so that's, that's where I, I come from, I think. And so, cause, cause to me that what you're describing, that is Venetian society and merchant of Venice. That's how I read that like coterie of young men in Merchant of Venice is as a freaking like swath of threes. You've randomly got Antonio in there as like the besotted two. And you've got Portia who's a, you know, bored out of her skull one, like hold up. And um, it's the, um, oh, and then Shylock is a, as a, as a two as well, probably. Um, and it's just, it's so, it's deceit and image colliding with principle and reform and the question of, like, whether authentic love can can happen and thrive in a society that is built on artifice. So, um, 
that that world, that environment that you're describing, Jeremy, I, I definitely think Shakespeare was interested in it. I just don't happen to see it in Midsummer. I see it as like being quintessential of of Merchant. Um, I'm, th- I'm curious though, do you do you think Bassanio really cares about Portia like at all? Um, I think by the end of the play, yes. Mm, okay. I think we're supposed to think that everything everything except the Shylock piece is right by the end of that play. That's what I think we're supposed to think. But is that what you think? No, I don't. But I think that's okay. what we're supposed to think. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. If you enjoy the work of Sweet Tea Shakespeare, you can find us all over the socials. We're on Facebook. We have a special secret Facebook community group that we'd love for you to join. Uh, We're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. We're on it. We're even starting TikTok. Uh, So join us, click in, give us a like, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you in all of those places. If you'd like to contact us, we urge you to do so at hours at sweetteashakespeare.com. That's H-O-U-R-S at sweetteashakespeare.com. Um, but I do, I think Bassanio is also like a classic three in the same ways that I think Demetrius is a classic three. I think if Helena had money, like if she really had real money, Midsummer would never have happened. Like the plot would never have happened. Um, what else did we... Yeah, can we talk about Richard the Third? Sure. Because I went back and forth. I went back and forth on this, and it sounds like you did too. Yeah, I, I um, so uh, he could be one of a few things for me. I mean, obviously, there's some eight energy. Yeah. Um, and um, and there's some um dark nine energy, I think. Uh, and and he is concerned with achievement. And yeah. he is concerned with doing, and he knows it. I mean, and and laments the fact uh, repeatedly throughout the play that because of his physical condition, he, the the way other people have treated him from an early age has all had to do with accomplishment, because he cannot accomplish things in the traditional conventional sense. He he's deformed. He's he's um. Uh, he's he's not firstborn all of those kinds of things and so it's um it's it's conditional on his actions and so i see a lot of potential uh that he's a three there and certainly there's a there there's like a version of richard the third that is not not at all unlike a version of donald trump um yeah and and um the, the 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 narcissism and the we, we mentioned three with the twoing is charm. Um, mm-hmm. There's certainly that kind of charm and manipulation. He, he, I mean, the, yeah. the, the most famous scene in that play is the charming scene, right? Where, where he is able to uh, having, having mur- murdered someone's husband, basically charm his way out of the consequences, at least initially. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of that, that resonates with me. And, He's, he's, a he's a weird guy. Um, like from a, he's creative, like a four. Um, and he is, um, actually kind of strangely generous, like a, like a, like a nine peacemaker type. Um, and, uh, he also, is evil, which is hard to sort of map onto. <laughs> like he's just actually evil. He's a psychopath. He's th- there's, there's, there's not a lot of, I mean, there are like superficial good things that are going on uh, yeah. with his approach, but it, but yeah. um, there's nothing good going on underneath. And it's sort of hard to map that on, onto, uh, onto a number that most of them sound to me like they have good sides and bad sides. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, that's what I got. I'd lean three, but I I don't know. I might change my mind after I hear all of them. Yeah, I mean that's that's my thing too. Is I think um, I didn't so much go the dark nine route, but he does have a almost an obsessive compulsion to control 
not not just to be in control, but literally to control others, to control their actions, to control what they think. And to me, that's very eight. And yet um, he is he is so image conscious and he's so he is narcissistic and he can be charming and he's got that manipulative streak and that he's perfectly happy to be deceitful about his true intentions. In fact, he, he almost, he almost like he thrives in that, in, in that performance. And, um, I don't, it's, it's, it's clear that he has given up on obtaining or attaining his mother's affection. I think he knows that's never going to happen, but he certainly in the Henry sixes strives to, to act in a way that will curry favor with his father. Right. He definitely like, he definitely is, is team York, uh, in a, in a jingoistic kind of way that is, um, that his father really approves of. So if, if, if we think about it going back to his childhood, but if he became addicted to his father's praise early on, that might have like given him some of the, the complex that we see in Henry six parts two and three. Um, and yeah, I just, I see, I see a lot of three. I see a lot of achiever. Um, and I think. As he is, especially Edward, the oldest. And um, that Edward kind of perhaps his fatal flaw as a ruler, if not as a person is assuming that Richard would be happy achieving for the sake of Edward on the throne, right? That, that, mm-hmm. that his younger younger brother would be happy to to achieve for the good of his brother's rule. And that's just not the case. <laughs> yeah, and it's, um, really, it's really interesting because uh, I think there's a way to approach the character across those three plays yeah. uh, as two different numbers. And, and like a character was written and then another character was written and they happen to share the same name. But that, but but that Shakespeare kind of wanted to go a different direction. Um, I think Henry VI Part Three shows us a Richard that is much more like the Richard we see in Richard the Third. Um, but that Henry VI Part Two is is maybe more lands on me more like a two, um, and a sort of a, a like a, a I'm not a buddy figure exactly, but is there sort of in service of other people. Uh, and then you see his true intentions sort of emerge over the course of part three. And then obviously the whole thing is laid bare in, in Richard the third. Um, but there's a, I don't know. It's, it's, um, I don't think he ever authentic, but I don't think he ever genuinely wants to, to help. I think that he does because it gets him favor with the people who are going to help him ascend. Sure. I can see that too. I think there's a, there's a, um, I guess I would say his charm is more on display. Uh, it, and and it, like, that's his core identity is a sort of like, um, he's, he's, he's the, I don't know what the term is. He's like a, um, the sardonic jester of team York and yeah. sort of piping in and, but it is all about the team, as you said. And then later we learn that, Oh no, that was not the game all along. And it's this kind of, shift where you you understand that what you thought to be was maybe authentic um team orientedness shifts into you know no he was he was in self-service all along and i think that i think that that is what is happening i don't see his type as shifting based on the the because what you're describing i think happens in shakespeare i really really do because the hot spur that shows up in Henry IV part one is, is a different human from the one in Richard the second. Like they're just different. Like I think Shakespeare just flat out changed his mind. <laughs> I think that even though he had already done the work of aging Hotspur down, cause in, in reality, Hotspur was the, that, that Henry Percy that is Hotspur was older than Bolingbroke by a couple of years, but they were peers. They'd grown up together. And in the Henry ad in Richard the second, he makes it very clear, like, no, actually, Northumberland and Bolingbroke are peers. Hotspur is Northumberland's son. He is therefore of Hal's generation. Like, he does, Shakespeare does set that up age-wise in Richard II. But, oh, my God, it's a different person who, like, 
pops out of the ground in act one, scene three of Henry four, part one. And I don't see that kind of like soul revisionism happening with Richard. I just think that Shakespeare doesn't give him a lot of text in Henry six, part mm -hmm. two. And so what we happen to see is just, just happens to be him like laying the groundwork mm -hmm. for his takeover. You know what I mean? But it, it seems to me that he seems more like a person across those three plays. Whereas Hotspur to me is, seems like two different people I get in you. those two plays. Yeah. What else are we talking about? What else are we talking about? All. Um, we have to talk about Bertram, Ariel, and Caliban, maybe. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, Bert, Bertram, to me, is a no-brainer. But Ariel and Caliban, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about that. We both had Prospero, so we both are sort of reading Prospero similarly. Yeah, I am. Um, um, so first of all, I'm not sure. As with all of these, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm hedging all of my bets. But um, uh, Ariel is... Um, I think Ariel a bit more than Caliban seems to be achievement oriented, especially when, when presenting to Prospero. The, so the, the whole story is sort of built around Ariel, the actor, uh, not just theatrically, but the, the agent going out and doing a performance and then coming back to Prospero and seeking approval. And uh, specifically around the question of, did I do this well enough? Did I check enough of these boxes, boss, that you're going to let me out of my contract with you? And um, and that there's a very parent-child uh, dynamic that you see between Prospero and Ariel that to me reinforces that. It's, it's not about the quality of Ariel's um, personality. It's about what Ariel can accomplish. Now that changes over the course of the play and I think Prospero does admit, uh, as part of the transformation in that play, no, I really do, Ariel, appreciate you, love you, on sort of on your own terms, and not just because of the, the things you can do. But Ariel's not built on that on that uh, early on. It's all about what can what can Ariel accomplish for me, um, and and if or from Ariel's perspective, like did I do this? thing well enough to uh unlock the affection or the agreement or the the whatever uh, needed from from uh prospero caliban is is a little bit of a different story and i may be reading that because I, I do see ariel and caliban as having uh really overlapping um uh and miranda for that matter really overlapping um, personality traits that they get from the father figure in that play. Um, uh, Caliban is worried about work. Um, he, I think he's, he's for me, he's like one of these, like maybe he's a three wing two or a two wing three kind of figure um, who uh, if he's a two, like you could see the resentment, you can see the help. He puts himself at uh, Trinculo and Stefano's feet, literally trying to serve them. Um, and, uh, but even that relationship is kind of work-based or you could flip it around and maybe there's a three wing two where it's some of that argument early on between Prospero Miranda and Caliban is about um, the doing of things and the, have I not, I've been laboring and laboring and laboring for you and I get no appreciation. Do you know what I mean? Um, and there is a, there is some narcissism built into that character as well. Um, that I think accounts for its darkness. Anyway, that's me. Okay. I don't think I know the Tempest well enough. Um, I'm a little bit scared of that play in a way that I'm not with a lot of Shakespeare plays that play. Like we got to talk about that, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> We do. Um, yeah, that play that play sets me on edge. Um, I just I don't know. I'm I'm thinking about motivations, and I don't know if I read Ariel's um, compulsion to like tick boxes with Prospero. Right? Did I do a good enough job? Did I did I hit all enough points on your bullet list, boss? Um, he does that. And I'm not denying that that is bedded. It's like embedded in his rhetoric um, of like, 
approve of me, approve of what I've done. And um, I don't know if I read that as coming from a place of actually wanting praise or commendation so much as, so we good? Can I go? Like, can I, can I be free now? Can I have my life back? Can you just leave me alone? And I feel like if Ariel was a three, Ariel would want to, to Ariel would want an orbit, would want to orbit around the, the source of the praise, would want to, con- to continue in that, in that pa- mm-hmm. plan and path. And yet what we find with Ariel is that Ariel is so eager to be free and so eager to get the hell out of, you know, away from Prospero and away from that, that family. Um, I just, I read it as like the, um, it's like, it's like if you have a, um, a crap job that you don't like and it's a, it's a contract, right? You're on, you're on a contract, not like a fixed, not like an ongoing salary, but like if you're on contract and it's, there's like nine items, you're like, no, no, no. So I'm going to do all the items really fast. I'm going to do, I'm going to work really hard and get these nine items done. I'm going to shove it under your face, boss. And be like, look, I did all the things and I did them really well. So we're good now. Right? Like I, I can leave. It's sexual and not not like Ariel is receiving actual emotional um, satisfaction from from the from the relationship, um, which is kind of what I struggled with when we talked about how Caliban might be a two, because I think the servitude thing is like murky. Um, but yeah, like I just I read I read Ariel as a seven who's who unfortunately is under contract and so is like having to like adopt the survival instincts of a three because Prospero is such a three, you know, it's like, okay, well, this is, this is his language. This is how he does things. He's in charge and he, I'm under contract with him. So I better figure out his, you know, his ethos and, and get good at, dis, at, um, uh, emulating it because the sooner I can do that, sooner I can go back to having fun. Um, so for me, it's just, it's the question of motivation. Cause I, I don't deny that his rhetoric is very three, but I just, I think that it's a mask. I think it's a great point. And I think it's great to underline that for folks, especially if they're just kind of new to the Enneagram, you can do anything. You can do anything that is like distinctive for each of the nine types for different reasons. So I know one of my examples that I always give is like, you can have a checklist. So essentially what you're saying, but you're going to complete the checklist in nine different ways for nine different core reasons. So it's always good to kind of deep or dig into, there is a connection between the three and the seven. Once again, with that, um, Hornavian group, the aggressive stances. Yeah. Um, so how they get their needs met. So typically for the three that is accomplishing as many things as possible so that they're able to receive the love that they're looking for. Um, seven is going to be trying to escape something. So actually that could be lending weight to your theory, Claire. Um, they are kind of assertive in a way to like move away or like against people to get away from something that they're not, um, comfortable with. Like they want to always kind of get out, um, and go towards the happier thing, the next thing, the, the, the bigger adventure, because they're not, uh, comfortable or like happy sitting here in this place that's uncomfortable. Um, so maybe, yeah, that could, that could be a connection there worth exploring. Yeah. So my, my theory is that Ariel is a seven who figures out how to behave like a three to get out of his contract sooner. Caliban though, I do think a three, once you started explaining it, I kind of understood. Cause I, I think that makes more sense than him as the two yesterday. I was struggling to, to see that, but I mean, maybe like a three wing two, for Caliban, which is interesting because that's the technically called the charmer and everyone is talking about how like uncharming and heinous or whatever Caliban is. Like everyone is so repulsed. But he does uh, a great job of, of charming Stefano. Do you know what I mean? That's and, true. And that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, but, and that, that's like his, his whole language now that we're talking about it, his whole language is how this Island is his like, yeah. Yeah. He's been displaced. His that's like the, the we're talking about with Hamlet, like the the natural order of things, which is me being in charge, is upset, and that's what I'm angry about. Do you know what I mean? Um, sure. And uh, actually, is like Stefano s- strikes me as a three as well, um, although a really bad one. <laughs> 
you know? And there's some resonances that those two characters have with each other. I don't know. Yeah. Hooray. Caliban, three wing two. We found you. <laughs> I see you. But I do. I think Ariel's a seven. Yeah, I get the party part of that. I absolutely do. Yeah. And the fact that, yeah, the desire to escape. It's security too. There's like a heart. There's a really anchored desire and need for security because you're moving into the headspace there. Um, so if that plays in at all, yeah. that's something I, I, to consider. Where, where I have just a little, like, like the slightest hesitation is that I do actually think that there's actual affection between Prospero and Ariel. Oh, interesting. That, that is not, um, it, uh, it's, it's, um, oh, well, hello, Brendan O'Neill from Wales, UK is saying hello to us. So hello, Brendan. Um, Hi. Um, but, but we're, we're like, it's like, um, there is some affection and it can't actually be expressed until Ariel's bonds are, are freed and, and, uh, Prospero knows that before Ariel does. Um, anyway, but that's where my hesitation is just a little bit. Nice. So, okay. Well, we have solved the world's problem. <laughs> yeah. We've, <laughs> we figured everything out. Um, offline, Claire and I are going to fight about um, all of the characters of Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and it'll be like either, either my three will be will be fighting against Claire's eight, or my eight will be fighting against Claire's eight. Um, and I'll decide which <laughs> hat I'm going to put on. Awesome, lucky me. So um, tomorrow we're talking about fours, which is also yeah, we a, are. a number I might be. Um, I'm excited about it. I mean, the fours I'm are like intimidated. These... I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Cause I feel like most of your audience is probably going to resonate pretty hardcore with the four. And I am super intimidated by trying to explain. Are you the saying type that our, that our <laughs> audience is mostly independent artists, weirdos with. Yeah emo problems yeah <laughs> i'm totally saying that you might be and right. i say that with so much love however comma <laughs> as the as the five <laughs> i'm like oh god <laughs> i'm a little <laughs> so we'll get through it it'll be great <laughs> i'm gonna incorporate that into my vernacular because i love it however comma <laughs> oh, yeah. that's such a that's such a useful way of priming someone for the fact that you are about to express there's a <laughs> I, I, I will say this. I test as a four more commonly than I test anything else. Oh, can we talk about tests real quick? Sure. I saw a comment in the group about tests. Um, and yep. I know that people are always super eager to take tests and, and just to get an entry point. Um, but I want to just throw some caution out, like take the test. Cool. Like there are tons of free tests online, but just understand a lot of them are marketing tools to gather your email address and put you in an email funnel or whatever. So they're, they're typically, they're really reductive a lot of times. So especially you take somebody like Jeremy, love you, Jeremy, but um, testing for Jeremy, a sport. He's like, okay, cool. Who do I want to be on this test? And he could literally probably answer. I could answer the questions to any typology test because I already am self-aware enough to know what answer I'm trying to get to. You know what I mean? So it's really hard to be like, honest with yourself. If you're not good, you know, if you're new to self-awareness or like, learning about yourself, it's kind of hard to answer the questions truthfully. Um, sometimes you're having to like nudge your spouse, like, Hey, what do you think? You know, whatever. But then that they're only seeing your behaviors. They're not, yep. no, they don't know what's in your heart, your motivations. So it, it's, I'm just saying it's tricky. It's complicated. If a test helps give you a starting point or helps you kind of eliminate some of the numbers, definitely do it, but hold the results really loosely. They're probably going to spit back two, three, four, five answers, right. That are, you know, similar in score. Uh, but again, that's just data points. So those aren't telling you that you're a little bit of all these five numbers, Jeremy, that's telling you <laughs> that you have answered the questions in such a way that it is presenting X amount of dominance in that type. So take those and then start from there reading about all the different types and the descriptions and the qualities and the wings and the, how they act in stress and start compiling, um, a better way to kind of list out the different traits that you're resonating. With. So find a test, take it if you want, but don't get hung up on it. And especially if it doesn't resonate right at, at first, um, don't give up. 
Like don't just toss the whole system because there's so much more to it than just what they can spit out um, in the little assessment. So I, I will also Good say that, yeah, I mean, I have taken, I've taken the test. I've taken different kinds of tests all over the place. And um, it's interesting um, as, as a person in a different mental space today, June, 2020, had I taken the test, say 14 months ago or 14 months before that, I could almost mm. guarantee you that the, the, the number would be different, even though the motivations really haven't changed. Do you know what I mean? But like my performance of the mm -hmm. test. So what happens, this is why I might be a three more than some other things is like, <laughs> I'm concerned when I'm taking the test, what it will, what it will look like. Huh. You know, like what like the results will it? look like. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And why yeah. I might be a four is because, I, like, I want I need the results to be special. That's me. Oh, exactly. Do you know what I mean? I can't be tested. I know. Yeah, I always you know. So, so, so it's I'm like. like and then if I am a four, when I get the four results, I'm like, well, that's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you both so much. This is a lot of fun. TTFN. Bye, friends. You've been listening to the Sweet Tea Shakespeare Hours. Our podcast was produced by Claire Martin and Jeremy Feebig. Ashanti Bennett is our general manager. Our theme song was written by Owen Eddy. This podcast was made possible by our friends at the Arts Council of Fayetteville in Cumberland County and our fabulous monthly sustainers at patreon.com slash sweet tea shakes. You can join us there for an exclusive weekly podcast and loads of other fun perks. If you've enjoyed your time with us today, subscribe to this podcast or leave us a review on whatever platform you get your podcasts from. If you want to hang out with us in a future episode, drop us a line at hours at sweetteashakespeare.com. That's H-O-U-R-S at sweetteashakespeare.com. Thanks again for listening to the Sweet Tea Shakespeare Hours. Until next time, you that way, we this way. <laughs>